Excellent. So let's get started then. Um, super excited to welcome Li Hua Lei to us uh, giving an algo hour on uh, conformal prediction and uh, causal inference. Um, very excited to have him here. He is a postdoc at the Stan uh, Stanford Statistics Department, currently working with Professor Manuel Candes. Um, previously, he got his PhD uh, from UC Berkeley, advised by uh, Peter Bickel and Michael Jordan. And he's worked on a range of uh, different topics spanning causal inference, uh, hypothesis testing, uh, some network analysis, even optimization. So uh, he has a wide range of expertise and very excited to hear him give a talk today. Take it away. Thanks for the kind introduction and also thanks for the invitation. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, that works. Um, by the way, uh, before you get started, uh, feel free if you have questions to put them in the chat. We'll monitor uh, the chat and ask uh, questions when they come up. And of course, also at the end, you're welcome to, to um, ask questions then as well. Anyway. Great. So uh, I'll get started. So today uh, it's my great pleasure to share one of my recent work on conformal inference of counterfactuals and individual treatment effects. And this is a joint work with my postdoc advisor, Emmanuel Kendis. So, cause this talk is going to, um, it's about conformal inference, which may be an unfamiliar term to you, but that's fine. And I hopefully, um, after finishing this talk, you can learn something from conformal inference, which is some magic. It's definitely not developed by us. It's developed 20 years ago by uh, some other people. But uh, we kind of apply this framework into the causal inference problems. And throughout this talk, I will mention quite a few concepts, um, but no background is assumed because I, I will first give you a primer on some of the key concepts that we're relying on. And first, our talk, so our work um, can be adapted to multiple causal frameworks. And in particular, in this talk, I will focus on the potential outcomes. And here is a brief primer on potential outcomes. So let's say, suppose we have two guinea pigs and they live in the parallel universes. So everything is the same. And then in one of the parallel universe, we apply the treatment and then we observe the outcome. So you see that in this case, when, once we give the guinea pig the treatment, then the guinea pig will survive, otherwise it will die. So this is the observed outcome, while these two outcomes are potential outcomes. And in words, a, pot a potential outcome is what would have been one's response had one taken the treatment. And this concept is first proposed by Jersey Neyman in 1920s and then developed by uh, Don Rubin in 1970s. And in particular, Don Rubin calls something called science table, which is roughly this. So let's say, suppose we have 10 units and five of them are assigned into treated and the other five are assigned into control. Then by definition, we can observe all their covariates. And for treated units, we can observe their Y1, the potential outcomes had they been assigned treated. While the, for the control units, we can observe their Y0. But for treated units, we cannot observe their Y0, while for a control unit, we cannot observe their Y1. So these crosses are the missing values. And this is what Don Rubin called science table. And in particular, we say that the observed outcome equals to the potential outcome only depending on their treatment assignment. And this is the assumption which people usually call SUPA. And throughout this talk, we will focus on this, uh, this scenario. So given this background, we can begin to talk about individual treatment effects. And here we will use this T to denote a binary treatment. And in this talk, we will only focus on the simple case with a binary treatment as a starting point. And then we de denote by Y1 and Y0, the set of the pair of potential outcomes. And finally, we use X to denote the covariates. And throughout this talk, we will make three very standard assumptions. And the first one is we have ID data. And the second one is the SUPA, which I just introduced. And the third one, which is a strong assumption, but often assumed as, as, as a starting point, which is the unconfoundedness. 
So just in case you haven't seen this before, this assumption is saying that the set of potential outcomes is independent of the treatment given the covariate. In other words, this means given a value of covariate, we have a completely randomized experiment. And of course, you may say that all these assumptions are strong, like the ID assumption can be relaxed in the literature and the SUTFA is violated in the case with interference. And unconfoundedness is of course too strong because in practice, we always have a major confounder. But you see that all these assumptions are pretty standard. So beyond this assumption, we're really getting into a new regime in causal inference and things get, are getting much more complicated. But here in this talk, I will focus on the simplified assumptions just to illustrate how conformal inference is working. And in the future, I believe that once you are getting into this area, you will find a lot more interesting applica applications that works under much um, weaker assumptions. So here, our goal is a little bit non-standard. So our goal is to find an interval estimate, C hat, as a function of the covariate, such that it covers the individual treatment effect with probability at least 90%. And here, the individual treatment effect, ITE, is defined as y1 minus y0. So the reason that this is non-standard is that this ITE is a random variable in general, unless you impose strong assumptions on y1 minus y0. Otherwise, it has some variability. And our goal is to cover a random variable with probability 90%. So it looks like confidence interval, but it's not quite. And in, in the pre, uh, predictive analytics literature, people often call this predictive interval if you treat this IT as an outcome. But here things are more complicated because Y1 minus Y0 can never be observed for any person. So in other words, we're doing predictive interval on something that can never be observed. So unpacking this a little bit. So we're going to estimate the outcome variable in both the treatment and the non-treatment. And then we're going to take the difference in those estimates. And I guess I'm confused a little bit about, you know, you, you just said we never observe both Y1 and Y0. So we have to be using estimates or estimators for these. So then what does this 90% refer to? Is this like subselection or something? Yeah, I'm confused. Yeah, that's a great question. So let's say suppose, so you can view the C hat as a function. So it is something you learn from your data, but instead of having a point estimate, now you have an interval. So now you learn two numbers given each X. And now you consider future patients. And this future patient will have X, Y1 and Y0. And for this future patient, or sorry, I shouldn't have used patient, but yeah, usually when we introduce this, we consider something like clinical trials, but like for future unit, this ITE is like, it exists, although we cannot observe it, but we want this interval to give enough information about this ITE. So say, suppose this interval is five to 10. Then we wanna say that for 90% of the future units, this five to 10 will cover this uh, IT. So it has this very similar interpretation as confidence interval of a parameter, except that for confidence interval, that number is a fixed number, but here it's a random variable. Yeah. And then the next two points are also related to your question. So you see that given this, at least we have two tasks. The first one is, suppose we want to make inference on subject in the study then by definition, only one of her potential outcome is missing. So in this case, I will show that we only need to make inference on her counterfactual. But of course, a more difficult task is that for subject not in the study, both of her potential outcome have yet to be observed. So this case is what we call pure IT inference. And in this talk, I will mostly focus on the first part because this is the part that highlights the, the use of conformal inference. Well, the second part, I will touch upon that, but uh, for, for more details, you can check out our papers. Okay. 
So before going to our method, I want to take some time to discuss about this estimate, which is individual germ effect. And I want to contrast it with a more standard estimate in the literature, which is the conditional average germ effect, Kate. And the definition of Kate is the expectation of ITE given X. So of course, there has been a tremendous literature on, on, this, uh, on this estimate. And there, there has been a lot of great methods that can be used to estimate this. And I think I like it a lot. But I think in this talk, I want to point out two limitations of this case. And these two limitations are really depending on your applications. So in some cases, these two limitations are crucial, are fundamental. But for others, maybe it's not a real limitation. So both limitations are about uncertainty. And the first one is, by definition, Kate is an average. Even if it's a conditional average, it's still an average. So in general, unless you believe that your ITE is a deterministic function of X, Kate is not equal to ITE. So in other words, suppose we don't have that many covariates like we have age, gender, height, smoking, then the following three scenarios will give you the same Kate. But in the first one, everybody gets a positive treatment effect, in which case we should definitely recommend th this treatment. Well, in the third case, only 20% of them get a huge positive effect, while the, the rest of 80% are getting a negative effect. So in this case, I, I'm not, I don't know whether we should recommend it. It really depends on the application. So you see that because Kate is an expectation, so it should be interpreted as a group average tri treatment effect. It's just that when we have a lot of X, this group is, can be very fine so that we can say more about these groups. But in practice, we know that we often don't have, even if we have a lot of X, but the number usually doesn't matter. The, what's matter is how much information of X can be used to um, explain away the variation of IT. In terms of, suppose you're uh, fitting a linear regression and we know that our R square is rarely going to say 0.99. I mean, in physics, we, we do get that, but in most of other applications, we don't have that. And, it is often the case where we get R square equal to 0.5 or 0.2 or even 0.05, depending on your area. So in this case, that means there's still a tremendous amount of variability that hasn't been explained away by the covariates. So in this case, Kate may be dr dramatically different from IT. Um, I'm confused here though. Why can't I construct a conditional variance here? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Definitely can, yeah. So usually, um, you see that when people estimate Kate, they will produce confidence interval of Kate, but that's not the conditional variance. So another way to tackle with this problem is to get Kate first and then get conditional variance second. But in this case, in the causal problem, we know that conditional variance is not identifiable. It's only partially identifiable. So we can definitely do that. That's a very good alternative method. Yeah, but another tricky thing is about what criteria can you get on conditional variance? Because that's another conditional expectation estimation problem. So that's about my next point, is that <coughs> Kate, because Kate is an estimate and we only have finite samples to estimate it. So there's another level of uncertainty, which is due to finite samples. And of course, if you go into literature, you can see, see a lot of fancy asymptotic theory, which tells you that you can do it if n is sufficiently large. But we really know how large is sufficiently large. And let me show you a simple simulation example, which I will give you more details later on in the, in the talk. But, so, but here, um, it's just a simple, very simple data generating process where you should expect every method to work well in this setting. And in the left panel, we have only 10 covariates. Well, in the right panel, we have 100 covariates. And here in this setting, we have 1,000 samples. 
and everything is smooth. And for this example, I uh, apply three very popular methods, causal forest, X learner, and bot. They all have very good accuracy in terms of the point estimate. But here, my goal is to evaluate their coverage because they also produce confidence intervals of Kate. And you see that if I set the target level as 95%, their coverage can be poor. It's not always poor, but in some cases they can be poor. Like here, you see that the coverage is only 80% or even 50%. So this is worrisome because the coverage is a very sensitive metric. When you set the target to be 95%, it may be okay if you get 93%, but it's not okay if you get 90, and let alone you get 75 or 50. So that's overconfidence. And overconfidence can be dangerous in many applications. Can I, Can I interrupt <laughs> with two questions from the chat? <laughs> sure, sure, please. Uh, so first, Zenke is asking a, a clarifying question, uh, whether Y1 and uh, Y0 are assumed to be drawn from the superpopulation. So the probability statement on your previous slide um, is integrated over, oh yeah, this one is integrated over Y1, Y0, and the distribution of X. Is yes. That, is that exactly. a correct way to think about it? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. And then Joshua asks, uh, what you mean by coverage on your last slide? Uh, on this slide? No, on the on your last slide. Oh, the I one see. You just talked about. On this one, right? So yes. that's a great question. So here, um, ideally, we want to get coverage conditional X. So we want to say that the confidence interval. So here, because they are covering a function, so essentially they are producing a confidence band of this function. And so for each single X, we can see whether this sample is covered or not. But this is too strong. So instead, I evaluate a weaker criteria, which is the average co coverage, meaning that I generate a bunch of other IID samples. And for each of them, I see whether the confidence interval covers the true case. And then I only com compute the average of them. So you see that this is much weaker than what people usually want. And if you can achieve conditional coverage as in the theory, then you should also achieve this much weaker criteria. But you see here, even this much weaker criteria is failed to be satisfied. Yeah. I had one quick question here, which is in these covariates, are these continuous covariates or are these nominal features and when we do that specification for x equals x, are we setting like the tuple of covariates simultaneously to equal one value? Like uh, here the, in this example, so later I will give you the details of this example. Um, but roughly speaking here, everything is very simple. It's like all the covariates are Gaussian in this case. Mm -hmm. And so they are continuous, they behave well. And the k function is the smooth function and also sparse, which only okay. depends on a few, uh, only two variable in this case. And the propensity score is also a uh, smooth and sparse function, which only depends on one variable. So everything here is, is very simple. And the point of this is that for simple uh, data generating process, we should expect all methods to perform well. But my point is, even for such a simple data generating process, the existing method may fail in terms of coverage, okay. even if they have great accuracy of point estimate. Cool. Okay, so this is a um, tweet from Judy Pearl. And you see that he strongly advocates this distinction between Kate and ID. And so in some sense, Kate is always a group average effect, while ITE is the true individualized effect. So having said all of this background, I can move on to our method, which is the fun part, I think. And so let's start by, uh, by the counterfactual inference, meaning that we want to make inference on subjects in the study. So in this case, let's imagine that we have a testing control unit. And for this unit, we know that we can observe her Y0, but we cannot observe her Y1. And in this case, if we can construct a C1 hat X that covers Y1 with probability 90%, given that this person is in the control group, 
then we can contrast this interval with, the, with her observed y0. And it is almost trivial to, from here to here that this interval will cover the ITE with probability 90%, given that this person is in the control. And similarly, we, for a testing treaty unit, we can do the same thing by constructing a C0 hat for Y0, given that this person is in the treaty group. And again, we can contrast these two things to get an interval. And you see that now if we use this interval for ITE, then we know that this interval will cover the ITE with probably 90%, given both t equal to 0 and 1. So unconditionally, this will be a valid interval in our case. So in other words, for subjects in the study, we reduced the task into finding a C1 hat that covers Y1 with probability 90%, given that this person is in the control group. So we reduced this problem into another problem, which is we called, what we call counterfactual inference, because here we only need to make counterfactual intervals. So before moving on to the conformal inference, let me briefly review the data generating process for a general observational study or a randomized experiment. So here we know that the propensity score is defined as the probability of tr being treated given the covariate value. So here for everybody, we have this EX, we have this propensity score. And then for each person, we flip a coin based on this propensity score. And then we decide better to assign them into treated or control group. And here, let's say we have 10 people and we have five treated and five control. And by suitable, we know that this, this uh, 10 icons give their observed outcomes. But under the hood, there are also unobserved counterfactuals, which are Y0 for treated units and Y1 for control units. So the goal here is to infer the Y1 of a control unit. Or in other words, for this blue person, we want to make inference on this pink one. And so a naive idea is that because our goal is to make inference on Y1, so why not just use the observed treaty group? Because that group has this information. But there's a problem which is a distribution mismatch. So it turns out that as you can show using the strong vulnerability or uncompoundedness assumption, for the observed distribution, the joint distribution of X and Y1 can be decomposed in this way. So you see the first term is the covariate distribution of X. And by definition, it should be X given T equals to one because this is the treaty group. Well, the conditional distribution of y1 given x is just this. And for this group, for this pink group, we can still show that the conditional distribution of y1 given x is the same as the observed treaty group, but the covariate distribution will be different in general because this is the control group. So the covariate distribution is x given t equals to zero. And to summarize, here we have a distribution mismatch between our observed, distrib observed population and our target population. And in particular, this is a covariate shift. And here's the illustration. So you see that in top panels, we give the scatter plot of y1 versus x in the real world and in the counterfactual world. You see that this two sc sc scatter plots looks very different. But given each value of x, the distribution of y1 is identical. This is guaranteed by the unconfoundedness assumption. But the difference between these two plots are purely driven by the difference of the covariate distribution. And that's what we call the covariate shift. So I, I guess like, are, are you, you're not assuming randomization or anything like that here. You're right, this is just like in a general setting, the people that would be treated uh, are likely different from the people in control. Is that what you're getting on here? Yes. Here okay. we allow uh, the general observational study where um, the propensity score cannot, can be a non-constant, but still we need unconfoundedness, meaning that we should be able to measure all confounders. 
And here you've also not made any allusions to sort of the the primary population's distribution on X. So for example, like um, these are both being drawn from the same global population and that global population, it too has a distribution on X. And I would expect to see like that also in the picture for comparison. Yeah, that's a great question. So later on, I will touch upon that. So our method can, cool. can be also adapted to that. So that's what was, uh, if I understand, if I understood your point correctly, uh, that's something called transportability or generalization, where your primary population, which is your study population, it may have an additional difference uh, with your target population. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm. I'm very interested in the case where you have non-representative, not re, non-representability in one of your samples. So yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's another case which can be directly handled in our method. But you see here, even if your sample is representative, you still have this covariate shift. That's an important point because here our goal is to make inference on this distribution while our observed population is, ha, has this distribution. So even if there's no further covariate shift, you get a co covariate shift due to the selection. But you are considering a more general problem where you have an actual covariate shift due to the non-representativeness of your study population. Okay. Yeah, that's a more general case. Yeah, great question. So now having said all of this, we can rephrase our goal as using the IID samples from one population, from one distribution, to construct a predicted inter interval that covers the outcome with 90% coverage under another distribution. So that's our goal. And here, as I mentioned before, we have a covariate shift. And this covariate shift, usually defined via a dens density ratio, is this term. And using a simple Bayes formula, you can easily show that this is proportional to one minus propensity score divided by propensity score. So in other words, this covariate shift is purely constructed, uh, is purely driven by the propensity score. So in other words, if here you have a randomized experiment or a completely randomized experiment where the propensity score is a constant, then you don't have a covariate shift. Okay, that, that's quite intuitive. But even if you have a randomized experiment, but you do some stratification or blocking, and you give different intensity to different strata, then you still have a covariate shift. Okay, so that's pretty much about the causal part. Sorry, yeah. one more <laughs> interruption. The stratified sampling in that, you're saying that's kind of like the simplest minded approach, which is take some underlying distribution on the covariates that both of your treatment and untreated populations can satisfy and just subsample the, the, the samples and then evaluate your Kate from that. Is that what you mean? Uh, kind of, yeah. What I mean is, so suppose you are doing a blocking experiment where you block all, uh, say, gender and uh, and other uh, demographics variables, but you wanna assign more treated units in certain groups while assign fewer units uh, in other groups. So there you see that the propensity score will depend on the demographic variables you are using to stratify. And in that case, you still have this covariate shift. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's pretty much about the causal part. So if you're working on causal inference, nothing is, uh, it's surprising in, in my previous slides because that's, uh, that's the standard setting. And now I'm getting to the more exciting part, which is the conformal inference part. And for those who don't know this, um, this is a generic machinery developed by Volodymyr Volk in 1999 or 98. And it was further developed by his colleagues and himself. And recently it was getting a lot of attention in statistics community. And here, I won't give you a detailed account of the whole history or things like that. But roughly speaking, this is a framework which operates on IID samples of X and Y from one distribution. And then this framework can wrap around any black box predictive algorithm, whether it's linear regression or neural net, anything you like. You give this algorithm to this framework. And then this framework will fit the values and then 
produce a C hat such that it covers Y with probably 90% in finite samples without any assumption on the distributions. So it's a magic. So there's no asymptopia. There's no assumption on the distribution. There's no assumption on which algorithm you're using, but you always get this guarantee. So in other words, you can view this as a calibration algorithm, which can calibrate whatever you produce to something reliable. And don't worry if you don't get this detail, because later on, I will give you an illustration of how this algorithm works. But the first of all, we see that, of course, we want to apply this framework. But here we have a covariance shift. You see that here it's, it is crucial that the target distribution has the same distribution as the observed distribution. But here we have a covariance shift. And fortunately, we can apply an extension of this conformal inference, which we called weighted conformal inference. And this was developed uh, last year. And similar to the standard conformal inference, this method will operate on ID samples from a distribution. And again, it can wrap around any black box algorithm and then produce a C hat X that covers Y with 90% coverage under another distribution with the covariance shift. And in particular, in this talk, I will introduce a particular form of weighted conformal inference called weighted split conformalized quantile regression. And now let me illustrate how this works. So this method will first randomly split the data where you observe treaty group into two folds, a training set and a calibration set. And then on the training set, you fit the five and 95th percentile of Y1 given X. And here you can use any method. You can use linear quantile regression. You can use quantile neural net or quantile random forest, whatever you want. Or you can even be crazy that you use something that is not a quantile estimate. That's fine. As long as you produce two black curves that are not crossing with each other, that's fine. And we will call this a quantile estimate. And then you apply this est estimate on the calibration set. Again, you get two black curves. And once you get these two black curves on this calibration set, you calculate the sign distance between each point to this uh, to these two black curves. And in, in this case, the sign distance is defined as the distance of each point to one of these two envelopes, which is closer to this point, multiplied by a plus one if it's outside, and by minus one if it's inside. And we call this VI, the sign distance. And here, this is the mathematical formula of, uh, of this uh, definition. And then we do this for every point, for every green point in this plot. And we have a collection of them. And now we can have a histogram of this sign distance. And the standard conformal inference will directly operate on this histogram. But here we will do one more step. And we will reweight this histogram. And here you will see a relatively intense mathematical formula, but you don't need to parse it. And this is perhaps the most intensive formula in this talk. And the only thing you need to know is that this reweighting scheme is purely driven by the covariance shift and roughly speaking is proportional to the covariance shift. Meaning that if you know this covariance shift or you know propensity score, you can calculate this weight directly. Or if you don't know it, you can estimate propensity score and then plug in your estimate. So you know how to reweight this gray histogram to a blue histogram. And then you find the 90th percentile of this blue histogram and call it QX. And finally, you output an interval as these two black curves plus and minus QX. And this is the C1 hat produced by weighted split conformalized quantile regression. So now you see why I call this QX a calibration term, because once you give me your estimate of control quantiles, whether it is good or not, I don't care, but I will produce a QX that recalibrate this. So suppose the quantile estimate you gave me is too, um, is too conservative, meaning that it's 
that like the five percentile is too low while the 95 percentile is too high, then this QX can be negative, meaning that we're shrinking this to quantile estimate towards the middle. But if the quantile estimate are too anti-conservative or too narrow, then we will enlarge this band to achieve the 90th percentile, uh, sorry, to, to achieve the 90th uh, coverage, 90% coverage. That's pretty much about this method. So is there any question? I can ask a quick question. I was yeah. curious, uh, so you said the Q hats, the quality doesn't really matter. Uh, right, it works for any. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how doing better at Q hat affects performance? Yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly the, uh, the, the next two slides about. So here you see that coverage is essentially a type one error. And what we say is given any, uh, given any estimate with any quality, we can give you the right type one error, but it doesn't say anything about type two error. So later on, you will see intuitively the quality of this will affect the type two error or affect the efficiency of this interval. And that's my next two slides. So before that, is there any uh, anything unclear that I need to clarify about the method? So if there's no question, I, I will move ahead. So I hope that once you see those slides, you see that conformal inference is really simple. It, it, it's nothing. Sorry, there is a ahead. question in the chat. I don't know if you noticed it, but. Uh, sorry, it's hard for me to, to monitor the chat. OK, so no problem. Yeah. Um, so uh, Eddie was wondering uh, first about the like dimensionality here, and if the black box is handling the dimensionality, or if this is just on the outcome, which is 1D. And then he was also curious about if you needed a formal estimate for Q. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So you see here, the dimensionality doesn't matter. So here, what we need is an estimate of five and 95th percentile of Y1 given X. So if X is a trillion dimension, as long as you can give me an estimate using your favorite method, then that's fine. So the dimensionality doesn't matter. The type of X doesn't matter. And as long as your algorithm can work on that, then I can recalibrate it using our methods to give you coverage. So that's why I call it a wrapper. So it's wrapper round black box algorithms. And that's a very important feature because in the classical statistics, in order to achieve this error guarantee, we usually say, let's use our tailored method to achieve it. But nowadays we know that there, there is a plethora of good algorithms that can achieve very good accuracy in practice, which we don't understand why in theory. And here, the good thing about conformal inference is that now we can take advantage of this algorithm without understanding why they work well. But we give a actual protection that we, do, we can achieve this type of error guarantee just in case they didn't work in some cases. So here, the role of QX is a actual protection, but it doesn't sacrifice any flexibility in the algorithm. So this is a pretty good feature for modern machine learning and modern data science. Yeah, so definitely, I don't want to say, in order to get this type of error, we go back to some simple methods, which we know that that is clearly inferior to some fancier something nets. Okay, so now let's talk about what guarantee we can achieve. And the first example is the randomized experiment with perfect compliance so that we know the propensity score. And here by randomized experiment, it doesn't necessarily mean completely randomized experiment. It can mean something like stratifying experiment where you have different propensity score, but you know it. And in this case, we can show that the coverage is above 90% without any extra assumption other than the ID, SUPFA, and unconfoundedness. Of course, those are strong assumptions, but at least under those assumptions, we can achieve this guarantee without any assumption on the conditional distribution, without any assumption on the sample size, and without any assumption on the procedure to fit conditional quartiles. So that's why I put this figure here, is that 
as long as you give me the correct propensity score and an estimate Q hat, we can produce, we can wrap around this black box and give you a uh, trusted, trustable C1 hat. But of course, this lower bound itself doesn't say too much because we can always set the C1 hat to be minus infinity to infinity and we get 100% coverage. But that's not something we want. We don't want things to be conservative. In other words, if we claim 90% coverage, we don't want 92. And it turns out, under two mild conditions, one is that y1 and x are continuous. So there, there's no too much discreteness in the data. Or not everything is discrete. So if x is discrete, well, y1 is continuous, that's fine. Or if x is continuous where y1 is discrete, that's also fine. So this is a mild condition. And another one would be some overlap condition, meaning that for every value of covariate, we need at least some units to be potentially assigned into treated group and potentially assigned into control group. So we don't want some covariates such that the propensity score is one or zero. So in this case, we just need to bound the second moment of one over EX. And then we can get upper bound for this coverage as 90% plus some universal constant, which only depends on this overlap times n to the minus half. Or in other words, once we know how much overlap we have in the data, again, without any assumptions on these quantities, we can show that the coverage is upper bounded by 90% plus some small thing. And later on, I will show you some simulation study where you will see how tight it is in practice. So this is about randomized experiments, but of course, um, in many cases, even if you run randomized experiments, you may have non-compliance or you may have an observational study where you don't know exactly what the propensity score is. In, <coughs> in this case, you may want to estimate the propensity score. So let's say we use this E hat as an estimate of E. And then we can plug this into our methods. Then what we can show informally is that this coverage is approximately 90%. If either the propensity score is correctly estimated or the conditional quantiles are well estimated. So we only need one of these two assumptions to be true. So here, if we can estimate the, the selection mechanism well, then we can afford arbitrary model misclassification in, in, in the conditional quantiles. And on the other hand, if we can estimate y1 given x well, then we can afford any model misspecification in the propensity score. And moreover, this gets back to Sven's question on the quality of this estimate. So if it turns out the quality of this black box algorithm is high, meaning that you can get this conditional quantile very well, then on the top of this guarantee, we also have a much stronger guarantee that guaranteeing this coverage to be hold conditioning on x, meaning that if we give me a particular value of x, I can show that with high probability, this one will achieve this 95% coverage. So that's where the quality of Q hat kicks in. And if you're working on causal inference, you will see that this is quite similar to double robustness for average treatment effect, although the concept of double robustness is quite different. Like here, it's about coverage of interval estimate. Well, the classical one is in terms of the accuracy or consistency for a point estimate. So we call it double robustness, but they mean different things. And finally, this gets back to Brian's question. So what if we have more general covariance shift? So suppose, let's say, our study population has a covariate distribution P, while our target distribution has a uh, distribution Q, where P is not that representative. So then it turns out we can modify our procedure very easily by replacing this WX to something else, which is given in this. So you can see there, this term has two, uh, two things. One is the covariance shift between your study population to your target population characterized by 
how representative your study population is. And the second one is by propensity score, which characterized by how the selection mechanism bias your procedure. Right, so, okay, okay. Um, there's also a question in the Q&A, yeah. um, which is, why can you get a narrow conditional confidence interval via this conformal inference, but you can't estimate the variance of the Kate itself? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, let me, yeah, so I, I think this is a very deep question. So let me get this, the long answer short, and then uh, I, we, we can chat more about this offline. So here you see everything here is distribution free as long as you know the propensity score or you can approximately know it. But turns out uh, there's a very interesting result last year by Rina Barber from UChicago who proved that if you don't have any dist distribution or assumption on Y given X or Y1 given X, even if your outcome is binary, you cannot get a non-trivial confidence band for conditional expectation of Y given X. That's impossible. There's an impossibility result. So in other words, we can definitely do conditional variance estimation and conditional mean estimation separately, but there's no guarantee. So you may need some distribution assumption, something like smoothness. But here's something funny about smoothness. We often think smoothness is a weak assumption in practice. And I think that's partly true because smoothness has two components. One is differentiability. The other is bounded derivative. So the differentiability part, I think is fine. I can believe that most of the applications have a differentiable conditional expectation. But in what scenarios we, we know how smooth it is. So let's say, suppose we know this function, this conditional expectation or conditional variance is smooth, but we don't know how smooth it is. Then essentially we put no assumption on that data generating process. So in this case, putting it in a very pedant pedantic way, is that there's no way to do uniform inference or adaptive inference on that case. But other than that, I, I think it's better to put it offline. Yeah. Another question that came up in the chat is about plat scaling. Um, sort of like what's the relationship between plat scaling and what you're talking about here? Yeah, that's a great question. That's another deep question. Apologies if I mispronounce plat. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I think it's plat, yeah. So, Plot scaling is a way to do calibration, but it's, it, it's, do, it's doing calibration in a different sense. So roughly speaking, you want to, so, so once you get a estimate of the conditional expectation, you want to say that within each strata given by the estimate, the average of that outcome is approximately equal to that estimate. So that's what uh, plot scaling is targeting to do. And there are, there's also isotonic scaling or other calibration methods. And there's a whole literature on that. And again, there's another paper, not by us, but by, uh, by another group of people last year showing that doing calibration, distrib distribution, cal uh, sorry, doing distribution free calibration is also impossible. And for the same reason that you need some distribution assumption in order to achieve that. So in other words, plus scaling is a very useful method in practice, but it always has some implicit assumptions in order to achieve that guarantee that it hopes to achieve. But again, other than that, I'm happy to take that offline. Okay, so now having talked about all of this, I will briefly talk about IT inference uh, due to the time constraint. So roughly speaking, um, once we have the counterfactual inference as a tool, as a building block, then we can, we, we can do this, we, we can use it as a building block for IT inference. So the way we can get it is to generate Y1 interval and Y0 interval separately, applying a Bonferroni correction, meaning that if we want to get 90% uh, guarantee, then we generate 95% interval for C1 hat and C0 hat. And then we take the difference. And it's easy to show that uh, this will give you a valid interval for IT. And in our paper, we also propose another class of method, which we call nasty approach, but I don't have time to, to go through. 
and I, I don't plan to go through. <laughs> but so if you're interested, you can uh, check our paper, which is, so this is a quite intuitive method, although it's a little bit uh, hard to describe it in, in one or two minutes. So to summarize that, uh, we can use this kind of factual inference as a tool to make IT inference. And there are multiple ways to do it. And some of them are exact in the sense that they, they have the exact guarantee, while some of them are inexact. So give, in the last five minutes, I want to give you some empirical results, which are connecting to the, uh, the empirical result I show you at the beginning of the talk, because I think that's quite interesting. And some of them may be surprising to you. So here, this is this gives some details of the simulation. So this is a variant of the example from this uh, causal force paper. And here we generate X as Gaussian with either independent or correlated uh, covariance. And the dimension is 10 or 100. And to further simplify the problem, we set Y0 to always equal to zero. And in which case, the IT inference reduced to counterfactual inference. And for Y1, we generate, generate it as a conditional Gaussian which is quite simple, where the mean function depends on two variables smoothly, while the variance function could either be homoscedastic or heteroscedastic. And finally, the propensity score is a boundary away from zero, meaning that we have great overlap in this case. So overlap is not an issue. And it only depends on one variable smoothly. So here, for our method, uh, I implement our, our method in an R package called CF causal. Which is, which is available to download in my GitHub. So if you want to play with it, you can just download this package and it has a um, very detailed uh, tutorial on how to use it. And the first picture I'm gonna show you is a sanity check, which is echo, echoing the point I'm, I made at the beginning of the talk. So I call it a sanity check because this, is the, this picture gives you the marginal coverage of Kate so recall that our work is not targeted to cover Kate. Well, our work is, to, is, to, uh, is designed to cover ITE, but still we can evaluate our intervals to see whether it can cover Kate. And also we wanna evaluate the coverage of other methods, the causal, causal force, ex learner and BART. And you see that in all settings here, like homoscedastic errors, independent covariate, a correlated covariate had a scedastic errors, 10 dimension and a hundred dimension equal to a hundred. You see that the external and the causal forest often have lack of coverage, even if they are proved to have coverage asymptotically. And BART, so BART is a Bayesian method. And you see that for homoscedastic errors, it is okay. It is not perfect because it has conservative coverage, but being conservative is often better than being anti-conservative. So in terms of that, it's okay. But for heteroscedastic errors, you see bar still undercover. And for our method, you see that our methods are unfortunately very conservative, which is not good. But you see that because our goal is not to cover Kate, so it, it, it's not, so we, sh we shouldn't expect our method to cover Kate. But here, at least being conservative is better than being anti-conservative in many cases. So that's the first plot. And the second plot is really our thing. It's the, about the coverage of IT. So now you see, oh, so sorry, I forgot to mention that here I consider three versions of our methods. And the one is wrapped around BART. So BART is a Bayesian method which can give you posterior quantiles. And we wrap around that. And also we wrap around uh, quantile boosting, and also we wrap around quantile random forest. So th these are three versions of our method. So now you see all our methods have near exact coverage. So they're almost the same as 95%. Well, the other methods have relatively poor coverage, but we shouldn't criticize this method for having poor coverage because they're not designed to cover IT. But for BART, because BART is a Bayesian method, so you, if you replace the credible interval to predictive interval, BART should also be expected to cover IT in this case. And you see BART is doing a great job for homoscedastic errors, but the performance decays a lot when you have heteroscedastic errors. 
And the next one is about efficiency. So we see that just getting type one error is not sufficient. So here for each scenario, I calculate the Oracle length, which is the best interval length you can achieve. So no, no interval that has the right type of error should be shorter than this one. So now you see our method, at least for each scenario, there exists at least one setting of our method, which has an interval length pretty close to this Oracle lens. If you wrap it around quantile boosting or random forest. And for BART, you see that when BART performs well, it also performs well. But when BART doesn't perform well, like in this case, we know that it un undercovers. You see our method become very variable in this case. Although it, the intervals become longer, I think this is a good thing because it kind of detect what's going wrong in BART and be forcefully turning the interval into something which is variable. So somehow our method calibrate, find the errors in BART and then calibrate it. And finally, it's about conditional coverage. Like in our theoretical guarantee, we only have this marginal co coverage and we only have conditional coverage when the model is correctly specified. So you see that this may not be necessary. Like in this case, for random forest and boosting, maybe the model is well specified, but you see that conditional variance is pretty flat, meaning that even conditioning on the value of X, we could get 95% coverage, which is pretty good. And for BARS, if you still remember that on average, it achieves about 80% coverage, which may not be too bad, but you see that when the conditional variance or for particular X, the conditional coverage can be as low as 50%. So it's a little bit worrisome, but after wrapping around BART, we can save it a bit. So that's pretty much about the simulation results. And here I just wrap up. So in this talk, we propose the conformal inference of counterfactuals and individual dream effects, which is reliable in the sense that for randomized experiment, it can achieve near exact coverage in finite samples with any black box. While for observational study or randomized experiments with non-compliance, it can achieve doubly robust guarantees of coverage. And finally, if you're interested in conformal inference, you can check out the tutorial by my uh, postdoc advisor, Emmanuel Candice, at this Bernoulli IMS One World Symposium with title Conformal Inference in 2020. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much for that a wonderful talk, Liva. There's a few more questions in the chat. I know some people have to jump off, but you graciously agreed to stay a few minutes longer to answer them. So can I fire them at you? Sure. Yeah. All right, so Eddie asks about how this method relates to something like TMLE, which is another method for estimating slash generating confidence intervals on causal effect estimates using flexible estimators. Yeah, that's a great question. So TMLE, as well as many other methods are estimating average trim effect. So it's not estimating conditional average trim effect. So in other words, average trim effect is the expectation of ITE without conditioning. And in this case, TMLE and other methods like augmented IPW and the other methods all achieve this doubly robust guarantee. Although, although sometimes TMLE works better and sometimes other uh, estimators work, work better, but they're all targeting on this particular estimate called AT. And here we are targeting on a different estimate or predictive length, if you like, which is the IT itself. So here, strictly speaking, we cannot compare TMLE and AIPW with our method because we're doing different things. Excellent. Another question is if there is any recent work on conformal inference to clustered observations or for example, observations from say a single network, a social network or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I, I, I heard that there are some works on uh, conformal clustering but I'm not sure um, what it does. Because you see here, conformal inference is about, so the conformal prediction uh, itself is to predict something. Well, for unsupervised learning problem, things can be trickier because now you don't have the grounding truth. I think some people manage to um, 
change the perspective of conformal inference and apply that to uh, to unsupervised problems. But I think that's a very interesting direction that I should uh, look more into. All right, excellent. Um, two more questions. One is uh, uh, how to compute or what determines the theoretical limit of the interval length? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so here, okay, uh, let me go back to this guarantee. So what I didn't show here is that if this quantile estimate is good, then essentially the way we, we show this coverage guarantee is to show that this, this interval is approximately the five and 95th percentile of the true quantile. So in other words, once you have well-estimated quantiles, you almost get the Oracle interval. So in this case, we can answer a question that this interval is, is the oracle. But other than this, you see that if the model is misspecified or we don't have this correctly estimated thing, it's very hard to un answer this question because even in the classical statistics, we cannot say much about the efficiency under model misspecification, except in some um, special cases. All right, excellent. Uh, last question is by Alex, who asks, uh, does it matter how much data goes into training versus calibration? Yes, um, that's very important. So you see that here, although this guarantee doesn't depend on the sample size, but you have this upper bound. So intuitively, you don't want this upper bound to be too, too large. So usually we find that, um, like in our implementation, we usually use like 70, 30 split or 75, 25. And the intuition is from a earlier paper by uh, Mattel Sosia and Emmanuel Candis, which has done extensive uh, numerical studies showing that you should put a lot of data into training procedure in order to get a high quality estimate. But you want to also maintain a fair number of units in the calibration set so that you won't get into the trouble of, of this term. But yeah, in practice, I think 75, 25 or 70, 30 is, is a very good uh, rule of thumb. Okay, cool, that makes sense. Um, another question is, uh, it just came in. Uh, is there anything special about 90% or is that an arbitrary number? Oh, uh, no, nothing special about 90%. So you can replace this as one minus alpha. Yeah, uh, so here it's just for, for uh, simplicity and I don't want to, overabuse too many symbols here. Yes, makes sense. All right, excellent. I also see a reference in the chat for work on uh, belonging in a cluster. So feel free to check that out. Uh, if there's no more questions, uh, let's thank Li Wai one, once more for this fantastic talk. I really enjoyed that. Thanks so much for taking the time to come visit. Yep, thank, thank you. you.